Young Taiwanese today may not be aware that before the 1980s, the indigenous peoples were referred to as mountain people, mountain compatriots, and even savages. About three decades ago, a social movement rose up among indigenous communities that hoped to cast off their derogatory slurs. It ultimately took more than 10 years but the road led them to a new name and new legal protections. Tonight in our Sunday special report, we take you to revisit the journey. Indigenous peoples are an important part of Taiwan's diverse culture, but getting recognized as indigenous peoples didn't come by birthright. It came after more than 10 years of blood, sweat and tears. Summer sun basks down on the Kazanjigan village of the Paiwan tribe here in Pingdong County. 85-year-old pastor Lin Jenner makes his way to the church with vigor in each halting step. 30 years ago, it was just like this that he marched the streets, fighting for the dignity of the indigenous peoples. Uh, Flipping through photographs of the indigenous people's movement, Lin remembers his younger days. What drove him and his people onto the streets in protest? It was because prior to the 1980s, indigenous peoples were called names that did not belong to them. A lot of people called us mountain people or mountain compatriots, or they call us savages, which made you feel that they were discriminating against you. We were often called savages. Being called a savage can make you very uncomfortable. It makes you feel trampled upon. It makes you feel subhuman. It was very hard to bear. On December 29, 1984, an activist group was formed, Taiwan's first group dedicated to defending indigenous rights. The activists referred to themselves as indigenous peoples, a name indicating that they were the original stewards of the land that was Taiwan. The activists set out to remove the term mountain compatriots from the constitution and to replace it with the term indigenous peoples. In 1991, there was at last a movement to amend the ROC constitution. I noticed that they were going to add a provision for indigenous seats in the National Assembly, that they were going to enshrine that in the constitution. So at the time, I thought, we should seize the opportunity here, right at the level of the Constitution. We should try to make a fundamental change to protect our reputation. The activists prepared to demonstrate in April 1991 as the National Assembly convened at Yang Mingshan's Zhongshan Hall to review amendments to the Constitution. But their plans for the demonstration were leaked. And on April 15th, when 12 activists made their way to Zhongshan Hall, they were greeted by a cordon of police, all of them indigenous themselves. One police officer was the brother of Isyan Parad. The police chief probably thought that if it came down to an altercation, we activists would see that our own people were the riot police and the security officers, and that perhaps then the conflict would not be so intense. When the media noticed this situation, some of them had fun with it, writing that we were brothers, that it was a family quarrel between brothers, or that barbarians were deployed to control barbarians. Eventually, the National Assembly sent representatives to accept the activist petition. After that, it made no direct response to their demand, marking their campaign a failure. But the activists did gather wider public support for their cause. Unable to resist mounting pressure, the KMT's Central Standing Committee convened in 1992 and proposed some alternative names for Taiwan's indigenous peoples. Uh, Taiwan's 
The Central Standing Committee proposed changing it to Early Inhabitants or First Inhabitants. We were infuriated at the time. The term Early Inhabitants was a nickname for people who would get up early in the morning to exercise. And in the term First Inhabitants, the word first is a homograph for late, as in the late President Chiang Kai-shek. It means dead. Why would they give us such names? The proposals raised an uproar in the Indigenous community. On May 21, 1992, the activists took to the streets once more to defend the dignity of the Indigenous peoples. This time around, they were no longer a group of 12. Thousands of people across Indigenous tribes stood in the rain to lodge a petition outside Zhongshan Hall. Semi Lisai Lezhazhigan is the head of Sandiman Township. He was a college student in 1992 and one among the thousands of protesters. It was raining at the time. I remember that we were blocked off. We were calling out slogans saying, no more mountain people, no more mountain compatriots. We want to be known as indigenous peoples. After several waves of conflict outside the hall, representatives of the National Assembly came out to accept their petition, but emphasized that it objected to the activist demands. With tensions reaching fever pitch, the National Assembly voted on the so-called Mountain Compatriots article inside Zhongshan Hall. About a dozen indigenous college students tried to sit in at the National Assembly, but were barred at the door. When the votes were all counted, the result was to the activists' anger and surprise. The National Assembly ruled that it would keep the term mountain compatriots. We pulled out a banner during the protest. It said the Taiwanese government doesn't care about us. We were very nervous. So nervous that we held the banner so that it was facing the wrong way. So later on, we turned it to face the right way. After we did that, the police swarmed in and dragged us away. At the time, some of our sisters even started crying and shouting. That left a shocking impression on me. I realized then that indigenous peoples can't wait for their rights and interests to be handed to them. We have to fight for them. This footage of him struggling for indigenous rights was seen by his parents. They were enraged. My father was also a police officer. He saw it. He saw me protesting on TV. We were not rich. He said that the little money we had was given to me so that I could go to school in Taipei, and then I ended up going to this protest. At the time, the atmosphere was such that we were generally seen as recalcitrant factions. In each chapter of the indigenous resistance, there are countless bitter stories from protesters who, despite it all, stood united and pressed forward. And in April 1994, they received a response from then-president Li Denghui at an indigenous culture conference organized by the Council for Cultural Affairs and anthropologist Xie Shizhong. Then President Li made an impromptu appearance to give an unprecedented speech. It was a three-day event. It was only on the second day when we received news that on the third day, at the end of it, President Li would be there with a very important announcement to make. Sure enough, when he came, he had a very important announcement. He said, our national government should embrace the indigenous peoples. I remember the applause went on for a very, very long time. Thunderous applause rang out in the hall. It was the first time that a Taiwan head of state used the term indigenous peoples instead of mountain compatriots, which had been the official term for nearly 50 years. Indigenous activists in the audience were shocked but they dared not celebrate, because until the new name was enshrined in the Constitution, the war was not yet won. On June 23, 1994, indigenous activists, the Presbyterian Church, and the DPP jointly organized a parade to push for a new name, land rights, and autonomy for the indigenous people. This time, they took their appeal not to Zhongshan Hall, but straight to the presidential office building. Because 
More than 3,000 people turned out at the demonstration, making it the largest in recent years. A few days afterward, on July 1st, then-President Lee personally received the activists and expressed his support for their petition. Ik Yong and I went in with several other people, and I told them our appeal. This endorsement from the head of state was what catalyzed change. On July 28, 1994, the National Assembly adopted the Indigenous People Article for the Constitution, replacing mountain compatriots with the term Indigenous People. But for the activists, the mission had not yet come to an end. From the very start, they had wanted the plural form of Indigenous People indigenous peoples, which connoted their identity as a collective. They wanted rights allowed to ethnic groups, collective rights. If everyone could be a member of this group, then they could have greater strength in numbers. They wanted to pursue rights that had been lost. It was a difference of a single letter, but it made a big difference in their ability to claim legal rights. In 1997, indigenous activists once again mobilized thousands in a demonstration at Zhongshan Hall. This time around, to their surprise, they were received with open arms. The KMT was revising the constitution every year. Then in 1997, we proposed changing indigenous people to indigenous peoples and there was hardly any resistance at all. The new name marked a milestone in the history of Taiwan's indigenous peoples. In 1996, the central government created a first-tier ministerial-level agency to protect the rights of indigenous peoples. The new name gave birth to the indigenous people's basic law and related sub-laws created to safeguard their interests. <laughs> Today, the sky over indigenous communities is no longer darkened by stigma, but is clear with boundless possibilities.